let's welcome uh, Romita Roy from the Indian Institute of Technology at Goa. And she's going to talk about spin orbit coupling driven novel quantum magnetism in iridate double perovskites. So Romita, over to you now. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting on this topic, spin orbit coupling driven magnetism in iridate double perovskite. Firstly, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for giving me this platform to present my work. Uh, so my today's talk is based on these two publications. Uh, one of them recently got published just at the beginning of this week, and we mainly work on iridate double perovskites. So I'll just spend some brief time in talking about double perovskites in general. Now the perovskite structure is one of the most widely studied structure as far as transition metal oxides are concerned which has a general formula ABO3, where the B is a transition metal and it is in an octahedral environment of oxygen atoms. Now, perovskite structure exhibit a lot of interesting phenomena. If we further want to increase the multifunctionality of the structure, we can double uh, the formula unit and get what is known as a double perovskite, which has a general formula A2BB prime O6. Now the B and B prime atoms are two transition metals and they can belong to the 3D, 4D or the 5D elements of the periodic table or be a combination of two different series. And by having these two different series, we can incorporate two different energetics into the system. So what energetics I'm speaking of? Now, if I look into the transition metal, as I move down the periodic table, my electronic correlation U decreases, whereas my spin orbit coupling strength increases. So especially in the regime of 5D elements such as iridium, osmium, et cetera, my U and SOC are on an equal footing. So having said that, let me introduce the compound that we were working. So it is a series of uh, compound uh, strontium calcium FeIro6 double perovskite. Now the motivation behind having iron and iridium at the two sites was this, that iron is a 3D element with a strong electronic correlation and iridium is a 5D element with a strong spin orbit coupling strength. So by having these two in one particular system, we were interested to understand the interplay amongst these two energy scales. And at the same time, we wanted to look into the change in the, the evolution of the magnetism by doping at the non-magnetic sites, which is strontium and calcium over here. So moving on, uh, why are iridate double perovskites so fascinating? Now, this is the phase diagram for a correlated system where I have the spin orbit coupling strength lambda with respect to the hopping term T along the positive X axis and my electronic correlation U with respect to the hopping term T along the positive Y axis. And we can divide our graph into four quadrants. In the first quadrant where both U and SOC are small, we get a simple metal or a band insulator. In the large U limit, we have a MOT insulating phase and in the large SOC limit, we have a topological insulating phase. But the most interesting part of the phase diagram, according to me, is the fourth quadrant where equal effects of U and SOC can be felt. And it's a host of all these interesting phenomena, which I'm eager to analyze, taking the example of what is known as a spin orbit coupled MOT insulator. Now, this particular uh, term was first coined in this particular physical review letters in the year 2008 for the work done on strontium iridate, in which iridium is in an octahedral environment with a 5G5 configuration, and then it splits into the T2G and EG states, where all the five electrons are occupied in the T2G state, which further splits into J equal to three by two and J equal to half state, where the J equal to half state is in a half built situation. If we now look into the band picture, at the T2G manifold, we have a half filled situation, sorry, a partially filled situation, uh, which on the application of SOC splits into a J effective three by two band, which is completely filled and a J effective half band, which is partially filled. Further, with the application of U, we can split this J effective half band into a J effective half lower Hubbard band, which is completely filled and a J effective half upper Hubbard band, which is completely empty with a gap at the Fermi energy level. So what we can say here is that both U and SOC come hand in hand to open up the gap at the Fermi energy level. And hence it came to be known as a J effective half spin orbit coupled MOT insulator. Now, what is uh, a very important feature of this is that in this case, my angular uh, orbital angular momentum L and my spin angular momentum S are no longer the good quantum numbers of the system. And it is replaced by the total angular momentum G. And these are the G effective states, which we already obtained in one of the previous tutorials. 
What I would like to show here is that the nature of how the G effective states look like. So it looks like this. Now, if you compare it to the T2G or EG states, it is non-directional in nature, which is due to the entanglement of orbital and spin degrees of freedom. So with this, uh, this is a methodology slide. I wouldn't go into the details. Uh, we do first principles calculation using density functional theory, where we use the electronic density to study the ground state properties of the system. And we can incorporate various features such as Hubbard U or spin orbit coupling as per the requirement of the system. So this, if I look into the end compounds of the particular series I just showed you, that is for X equal to zero, we have SR2 FeIRO6, so the SFIO compound. And for, C, uh, for the X equal to one, we have CA2 FeIRO6, so the CFIO compound. Both of them are isostructural in which we have corner sharing alternating octahedras of the iron represented by blue and iridium represented by violet in all the three directions. And the void spaces in between these octahedras is occupied by the strontium or calcium atom as shown by the green spheres. Now these octahedras are not a regular octahedra in the sense that the bond lengths are not equal and also the bond angles are not equal to the ideally expected 90 degree. We found this distortion more pronounced in the case of CFIO as compared to SFIO. So with this idea about the structure, we went ahead to calculate the GGA plus U density of states for this particular antiferromagnetic configuration, in which we have the spins aligned antiferromagnetically in the AB plane and ferromagnetically around the C axis. So what we see here is that if I look into the iron density of states, it's completely filled in one spin channel and completely empty in the other spin channel. Whereas the iridium density of states, if I look into the T2G states represented by this orange toss, it's completely filled in one spin channel and partially filled in the other. Whereas the iridium EG states represented by the blue dots is completely empty in both the spin channels. Uh, the gap between the T2G and EG states for the case of iron D is around 1.2 electron volt and it slightly accentuates for the case of CFIO. Whereas in the case of iridium, it is as high as four electron volt. And uh, these are the values of the magnetic moment at the various sites that we obtain. And from the combined uh, results of, these, of the density of states and the magnetic moment, we could conclude that iron is in a 3D5 configuration in a high spin state of S is equal to five by two, and iridium is in a low spin state of S is equal to one, but the 5D4 configuration. So essentially, both these two systems are isoelectronic and isovalent at the same time. So now we looked into the, um, experimental figures, uh, what we see is that for the mag from the magnetization curve that it is reported the transition temperature for the case of CFIO is around 75 Kelvin and that for SFIO is 45 Kelvin. So that made us wonder why not address this, why is this happening given that again as I said they are isostructural uh, and isoelectronic and isovalent. Now to answer that is what the current motivation of the current uh, investigation that we did. So what we did is that we calculated the magnetic, sorry, we calculated the magnetic exchange interactions. Then we verified them using the hopping matrices. And also we tried to get a visualization of this exchange interaction using maximally localized Warnier functions. And then we also looked into the point from the point of view of magnetic frustration that is inherently present in the system. So this is the magnetic exchange interactions. We consider nine exchange interaction parts between iron, iridium, iron, iron, and iridium, iridium atoms. Um, three of them are between iron, iron. I'll just describe a few. So J1 is the in-plane interaction between iron and iridium, and J2 and J3 are the out-of-plane interaction. Similarly, for the iron, iron case, we have J4, the in-plane interaction, and J5, and J6 to the, the nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor uh, out of plane interaction. We similarly have for the iridium, iridium case. So we take into account these nine exchange interaction pathways and several possible spin configurations for both SFIO and CFIO. Then we map the total energy that we obtain from DFT into the Ising Hamiltonian to obtain the values as well as the nature of all these exchange interactions, which are tabulated over here. I wouldn't go into the details of explaining each and every one of them. How would, however, I'll be commenting on a general trend that we saw. Firstly, 
We find that the iridium iridium out of plane interaction G5 prime is the strongest for both SFIO and CFIO, and it is anti ferromagnetic in nature. And at the same time, we see if we compare the corresponding J's for the case of SFIO and CFIO, we see that the J values for CFIO are comparatively larger, which helps us to establish a larger transition temperature in the case of CFIO. Moving on to the next part, where will we talk? cross verifying this using hopping matrices. So this is the, uh, basically the kinetic energy term of the Hamiltonian, which comes from the electronic hopping. And we can map this uh, hopping term T uh, to the exchange interaction through the Kugel-Kumsky model. And that is what we did. We calculated the uh, hopping matrices for the iron iridium case. Now this is the in-plane and the out-of-plane matrix representing the in-plane hopping between iron and iridium and the out-of-plane hopping between iron and iridium. And similarly, we did for the iron-iron as well as the iridium-iridium case. Now you might wonder why is the rank, or, or, sorry, the order of the matrix different? This is basically because when we considered iron, we took all the d orbitals, whereas in the case of iridium, we only took the T2g orbitals because the EG orbitals are firstly empty and they lie far away from the T2g orbitals. So what we saw is that if we compare the most dominant terms, we see that the in-plane interaction between iron and iridium is stronger than the out-of-plane interaction. For the iron-iron case also, we find the in-plane interaction to be stronger. However, in the iridium-iridium case, we get a stronger out-of-plane interaction. And this, all these results, this is for the case of SFIO. And all these results are consistent with the magnetic exchange interactions that I previously showed you. So moving on to the next part, where uh, I'll be talking about Warnier functions. Now, when we are in a solid state environment, we essentially deal with block states. However, block states are not localized. And for correlated systems such as this, we are in need of localized states. And that is where the Warnier states comes into the picture. Mathematically, we can obtain them by a Fourier transformation. Now, what we do is that we map the total DFT bands to a low energy model Hamiltonian by taking into account few active degrees of freedom of the system, while we renormalize the passive degrees of freedom in such a way such that their essence remains in the system. This entire process is known as disentanglement and monearization. And we are to obtain a very good matching of this uh, total DFT bands represented by the black curves with the dotted band, which basically represents my Warnier states. And once that is done, we will be able to obtain what are known as Warnier functions. So in this case, we use the iron D and iridium T2G states again as the active degrees of freedom. And from them, the, we obtain the Warnier functions. And the Warnier functions have a central atom. And then we have tails at various neighboring sites. So the weightage of a tail at a particular site dictates the strength of the particular interaction. So with this, let me first show you the Warnier function for the case of SFIO that we obtained. Now in this case, this is the central atom, and I'm comparing J4, which is the iron-iron in-plane interaction, with J5, which is the iron-iron out-of-plane interaction. So we see that J4 is much more greater than J5, and J6 is almost negligible. Next, uh, this is again, here, this is the central atom, and I'm comparing J1, which is the in-plane interaction between iron and iridium with J4. And again, we find them to be almost comparable in nature. Uh, this particular Warnier function is very important because here, this is the central atom. And by the large volume of uh, or the weightage we have at this particular iridium site, we could say J5 prime, which is the iridium-iridium out-of-plane interaction, is the strongest amongst all. We get... Uh, Similar results in the case of CFIO, that is we get a very large J5 prime and also J1 and J4 are comparable. And we could say that the Warnier function trend is consistent with the magnetic exchange interactions. Lastly, I'll be talking about the magnetic frustration. So this particular uh, slide needs no introduction. That is if we have a square lattice, our life is easier if you want to fit an antiferromagnetic configuration. However, in for the triangular lattice, that is not the case. So what we saw in our system is that it consists of, of interpenetrating FCC lattice of the iron and iridium atoms. And because of that, it is already a geometrically frustrated system. On top of that, when we try to get the exchange interactions, um, which induces the long range ordering, let us see what happens. 
So these are the exchange interactions that I previously obtained. I'll be trying to fit them into the ground state antiferromagnetic configuration that we uh, obtained from our calculations. So this is for the case of SFIO. What we see here is that most of the exchange interactions are not being satisfied. For example, if I take the example of J1 here, it should be ferromagnetic as per my exchange interaction calculations. However, this particular spin configuration says that it should be aligned antiferromagnetically. There are various other such um, interactions which are not being satisfied. However, J5 prime, which is the strongest interaction is being satisfied in this case as well. Moving on to the case of CFIO, we see that most of the exchange interactions are being satisfied. So the, basically the green curves represent the ones which are being satisfied and the red ones are the ones which are not being satisfied. So what we can see from here is that um, in SFIO, there are a lot of competing trends of exchange interaction. Because of this, it is magnetically more frustrated compared to CFIO and hence it orders at a lower temperature than CFIO. Uh, I would also like to show another very interesting result that we find when we looked into the magnetization density at the iridium sites. So for the case of SFIO, if you look, it is uh, along the X direction for SFIO and in slightly canted in the exit plane for the case of CFIO. Now, if we compare these magnetization density, we see that this in the case of CFIO, these magnetization density are comparatively distorted. So again, that marks the question, why is there a distortion in the magnetization density when they are uh, isoelectronic and isovalent? So to understand that, we looked into the effect of an energy scale, which we did not think of yet, and that is the effect of the spin-orbit coupling. So this is the Hamiltonian for the spin-orbit coupling. We introduce a term called alpha, which we like to call the scale factor of the SOC strength. And we extrinsically change the value of alpha, that is, we lower it to as low as one tenth the parent strength and make it as higher as four times the original strength. And these are the plots of the spin and orbital magnetic moments that we obtain for the case of SFIO and CFIO. We kind of see a very non-monotonic variation. What is interesting is this part, is that again, these are the magnetization density uh, for SFIO and CFIO at the parent SOC strength, which I just showed you. Now, um, when, we decrease the SOC strength uh, for the case of SFIO, like around one tenth the SOC strength, we see that firstly, now the magnetization density is along the Z direction, like that of CFIO. And at the same time, the nature of the distortion has changed to that what we saw in the case of CFIO at the parent SOC strength. So what we could conclude from this exercise is that the effective SOC strength at SFIO is much larger than that of CFIO, although we would be expecting it to be the same. The reason being uh, in CFIO, as I just previously said, that the structural distortion is larger and hence the structural distortion competes with the SOC strength to diminish its overall effect. So with this, I come to my concluding slide. Uh, what we could say is that both SFIO and CFIO lie intermediate between an electronic correlation driven MOT insulator and the conventional SOC driven MOT insulator. We find SFIO to be magnetically more frustrated compared to CFIO. And also the larger values of um, Js for the case of CFIO suggest a larger transition temperature. We also see that SOC is a critical energy scales in such systems and the competition of SOC with other energy scale dictates its relative strength. So I would like to acknowledge uh, DST and IIT Goa for financial support and also my supervisor, Dr. Shudipto Kanungo for his uh, valuable contribution. And with them, I would like to thank you all for your patience. Thank you very much. I think at some point you said that uh, while uh, finding out your exchange parameters, you used a easing model. What's the reason? Uh, what? You used a easing model. Easing model. Like yeah, yeah. It's a Okay, Ising model. Yes. So my question is why you assumed it to be Ising? Okay, also it is like a simple spin model we wanted to map into. Like we know from the Ising model that if we have, we can basically get the value of J by there. Since the difference of the triplet and the um, singlet state, we can get a direct relation with the exchange interaction J. And that is why we mapped it to the Ising model because that is the simplest spin model that we had in hand. 
consider the matrix elements that uh, your lowest two states have to decide if it's um, if it's a Ising system or it's a Heisenberg system or XXC? Um, I don't have a direct answer for that, uh, but yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if not, then let's thank Romita again for a nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.